The Innocents Abroad by Mark Twain Chapter 57 It was worth a kingdom to be at sea again. It was a relief to drop all anxiety whatsoever, all questions as to where we should go, how long we should stay, whether it were worth while to go or not. All anxieties about the condition of the horses. All such questions as, Shall we ever get to water? Shall we ever lunch? Ferguson, how many more million miles have we got to creep under this awful sun before we camp? It was a relief to cast all these torturing little anxieties far away. Ropes of steel they were, and every one with a separate and distinct strain on it. And feel the temporary contentment that is born of the banishment of all care and responsibility. We did not look at the compass. We did not care now where the ship went to, so that she went out of sight of land as quickly as possible. When I travel again, I wish to go in a pleasure ship. No amount of money could have purchased for us in a strange vessel and among unfamiliar faces the perfect satisfaction and the sense of being at home again, which we experienced when we stepped on board the Quaker City, our own ship, after this wearisome pilgrimage. It is a something we have felt always when we return to her, and a something we had no desire to sell. We took off our blue woolen shirts, our spurs, and heavy boots, our sanguinary revolvers and our buckskin seated pantaloons, and got shaved and came out in Christian costume once more. All but Jack, who changed all other articles of his dress, but clung to his traveling pantaloons. They still preserved their ample buckskin seat intact, and so his short pea jacket and his long thin legs assisted to make him a picturesque object whenever he stood on the forecastle looking abroad upon the ocean over the bows. At such times his father's last injunction suggested itself to me. He said, Jack, my boy, you are about to go among a brilliant company of gentlemen and ladies who are refined and cultivated and thoroughly accomplished in the manners and customs of good society. Listen to their conversation, study their habits of life, and learn. Be polite and obliging to all, and considerate towards everyone's opinions, failings, and prejudices. Command the just respect of all your fellow voyagers, even though you fail to win their friendly regard. And Jack, don't you ever dare, while you live, appear in public on those decks in fair weather in a costume unbecoming your mother's drawing room. It would have been worth any price if the father of this hopeful youth could have stepped on board sometime and seen him standing high on the forecastle, pea jacket, tasseled red fez, buckskin patch and all, placidly contemplating the ocean. A rare spectacle for anybody's drawing room. After a pleasant voyage and a good rest, we drew near to Egypt, and out of the mellowest of sunsets we saw the domes and minarets of Alexandria rise into view. As soon as the anchor was down, Jack and I got a boat and went ashore. It was night by this time, and the other passengers were content to remain at home and visit ancient Egypt after breakfast. It was the way they did at Constantinople. 
They took a lively interest in new countries, but their schoolboy impatience had worn off, and they had learned that it was wisdom to take things easy and go along comfortably. These old countries do not go away in the night. They stay till after breakfast. When we reached the pier, we found an army of Egyptian boys with donkeys no larger than themselves waiting for passengers. For donkeys are the omnibuses of Egypt. We preferred to walk, but we could not have our own way. The boys crowded about us, clambered around us, and slewed their donkeys exactly across our path no matter which way we turned. They were good-natured rascals, and so were the donkeys. We mounted, and the boys ran behind us and kept the donkeys in a furious gallop, as is the fashion at Damascus. I believe I would rather ride a donkey than any beast in the world. He goes briskly. He puts on no airs. He is docile, though opinionated. Satan himself could not scare him, and he is convenient, very convenient. When you are tired riding, you can rest your feet on the ground and let him gallop from under you. We found the hotel and secured rooms and were happy to know that the Prince of Wales had stopped there once. They had it everywhere on signs. No other princes had stopped there since, till Jack and I came. We went abroad through the town then and found it a city of huge commercial buildings and broad, handsome streets brilliant with gaslight. By night, it was a sort of reminiscence of Paris. But finally, Jack found an ice cream saloon, and that closed investigations for that evening. The weather was very hot. It had been many a day since Jack had seen ice cream, and so it was useless to talk of leaving the saloon till it shut up. In the morning, the lost tribes of America came ashore and infested the hotels and took possession of all the donkeys and other open barouches that offered. They went in picturesque procession to the American consuls, to the great gardens, to Cleopatra's needles, to Pompey's pillar, to the palace of the viceroy of Egypt, to the Nile, to the superb groves of date palms. One of our most inveterate relic hunters had his hammer with him and tried to break a fragment off the upright needle and could not do it. He tried to prostrate one and failed. He borrowed a heavy sledgehammer from a mason and tried again. He tried Pompey's pillar and this baffled him. Scattered all about the mighty monolith were sphinxes of noble countenance, carved out of Egyptian granite as hard as blue steel, and whose shapely features the wear of five thousand years had failed to mark or mar. The relic hunter battered at these persistently and sweated profusely over his work. He might as well have attempted to deface the moon. They regarded him serenely with the stately smile they had worn so long, and which seemed to say, Peck away, poor insect, we were not made to fear such as you. In ten score dragging ages we have seen more of your kind than there are sands at your feet. Have they left a blemish upon us? But I am forgetting the Jaffa colonists. At Jaffa, we had taken on board some forty members of a very celebrated community. They were male and female, babies, young boys and young girls, young married people, and some who had passed a shade beyond the prime of life. I referred to the Adams Jaffa Colony. Others had deserted before. We left in Jaffa Mr. Adams' wife and fifteen unfortunates who not only had no money, but did not know where to turn or whither to go. Such was the statement made to us. 
Our forty were miserable enough in the first place, and they lay about the deck seasick all the voyage, which about completed their misery. I take it. However, one or two young men remained upright, and by constant persecution we wormed out of them some little information. They gave it reluctantly and in a very fragmentary condition, for having been shamefully humbugged by their prophet, they felt humiliated and unhappy. In such circumstances, people do not like to talk. The colony was a complete fiasco. I have already said that such as could get away did so from time to time. The prophet Adams, once an actor, then several other things, afterward a Mormon and a missionary, always an adventurer, remains a Jaffa with his handful of sorrowful subjects. The forty we brought away with us were chiefly destitute, no, not all of them. They wished to get to Egypt. What might become of them then, they did not know and probably did not care. Anything to get away from hated Jaffa. They had little to hope for, because after many appeals to the sympathies of New England made by strangers of Boston through the newspapers, and after the establishment of an office there for the reception of moneyed contributions for the Jaffa colonists, one dollar was subscribed. The Consul General for Egypt showed me the newspaper paragraph which mentioned the circumstance and mentioned also the discontinuance of the effort and the closing of the office. It was evident that practical New England was not sorry to be rid of such visionaries and was not in the least inclined to hire anybody to bring them back to her. Still, to get to Egypt was something in the eyes of the unfortunate colonists, hopeless as the prospect seemed of ever getting further. Thus circumstanced, they landed at Alexandria from our ship. One of our passengers, Mr. Moses S. Beach, of the New York Sun, inquired of the Consul General what it would cost to send these people to their home in Maine by the way of Liverpool, and he said fifteen hundred dollars in gold would do it. Mr. Beach gave his check for the money, and so the troubles of the Joppa colonists were at an end. It was an unselfish act of benevolence. It was done without any ostentation and has never been mentioned in any newspaper, I think. Therefore, it is refreshing to learn now, several months after the above narrative was written, that another man received all the credit of this rescue of the colonists. Such is life. Alexandria was too much like a European city to be novel, and we soon tired of it. We took the cars and came up here to ancient Cairo, which is an oriental city and of the completest pattern. There is little about it to disabuse one's mind of the air if he should take it into his head that he was in the heart of Arabia. Stately camels and dromedaries swore the Egyptians, and likewise Turks and black Ethiopians, turbaned, sashed, and blazoned in a rich variety of oriental costumes of all shades of flashy colors, are what one sees on every hand, crowd in the narrow streets and the honeycombed bazaars. We are stopping at Shepherd's Hotel, which is the worst on earth, except the one I stopped at once in a small town in the United States. It is pleasant to read this sketch in my notebook now, and know that I can stand Shepherd's Hotel, sure, because I have been in one just like it in America, and survived. I stopped at the Benton House. It used to be a good hotel, but that proves nothing. I used to be a good boy, for that matter. Both of us have lost character of late years. The Benton is not a good hotel. 
The Benton lacks a very great deal of being a good hotel. Perdition is full of better hotels than the Benton. It was late at night when I got there, and I told the clerk I would like plenty of lights because I wanted to read an hour or two. When I reached number 15 with the porter, we came along a dim hall that was clad in ancient carpeting, faded, worn out in many places, and patched with old scraps of oilcloth, a hall that sank under one's feet and creaked dismally to every footstep, he struck a light. Two inches of sallow, sorrowful, consumptive tallow candle that burned blue and sputtered and got discouraged and went out. The porter lit it again, and I asked if that was all the light the clerk sent. He said, oh no, I've got another one here and he produced another couple of inches of tallow candle. I said, light them both. I'll have to have one to see the other by. He did it, but the result was drearier than darkness itself. He was a cheery, accommodating rascal. He said he would go somewheres and steal a lamp. I abetted and encouraged him in his criminal design. I heard the landlord get after him in the hall ten minutes afterward. Where are you going with that lamp? Fifteen wants it, sir. Fifteen? Why, he's got a double lot of candles. Does the man want to illuminate the house? Does he want to get up a torchlight procession? What is he up to, anyhow? He don't like them candles. Says he wants a lamp. Why, what in the nation does... Why, I never heard of such a thing. What on earth can he want with that lamp? Well, he only wants to read. That's what he says. Wants to read, does he? Ain't satisfied with a thousand candles, but has to have a lamp. I do wonder what the devil that fellow wants that lamp for. Take him another candle, and then if... But he wants the lamp. Says he'll burn the damned old house down if he don't get a lamp. A remark which I never made. I'd like to see him at it once. Well, you take it along. But I swear it beats my time, though. And see if you can't find out what in the very nation he wants with that lamp. And he went off growling to himself and still wondering and wondering over the unaccountable conduct of number 15. The lamp was a good one, but it revealed some disagreeable things. A bed in the suburbs of a desert of room. A bed that had hills and valleys in it, and you'd have to accommodate your body to the impression left in it by the man that slept there last before you could lie comfortably. A carpet that had seen better days, a melancholy washstand in a remote corner, and a dejected pitcher on it souring over a broken nose, a looking-glass split across the center, which chopped your head off at the chin and made you look like some dreadful unfinished monster or other, the paper peeling in shreds from the walls. I sighed and said, This is charming. And now don't you think you could get me something to read? The porter said, Oh, certainly. The old man's got dead loads of books. And he was gone before I could tell him what sort of literature I would rather have. And yet his countenance expressed the utmost confidence in his ability to execute the commission with credit to himself. The old man made a descent on him. What are you going to do with that pile of books? Fifteen wants them, sir. Fifteen, is it? He'll want a warming pan next. He'll want a nurse. Take him everything there is in the house. Take him the barkeeper. Take him the baggage wagon. Take him a chambermaid. Confound me, I never saw anything like it. What did he say he wants with those books? 
wants to read them, like enough. It ain't likely he wants to eat them, I don't reckon. Wants to read them? Wants to read them this time of night, the infernal lunatic? Well, he can't have them. But he says he's mortally bound to have them. He says he'll just go a rarin' and a charging through this house and raise more. Well, there's no telling what he won't do if he don't get them. Because he's drunk and crazy and desperate and nothing will soothe him down but them cussed books. I had not made any threats and was not in the condition ascribed to me by the porter. Well, go on, but I will be around when he goes to rarin' and charging, and the first rare he makes, I'll make him rare out of the window. And then the old gentleman went off, growling as before. The genius of that porter was something wonderful. He put an armful of books on the bed and said, Good night, as confidently as if he knew perfectly well that those books were exactly my style of reading matter. And well he might. His selection covered the whole range of legitimate literature. It comprised The Great Consummation by Reverend Dr. Cummings. Theology, Revised Statutes of the State of Missouri, Law, The Complete Horse Doctor, Medicine, The Toilers of the Sea by Victor Hugo, Romance, The Works of William Shakespeare, Poetry, I Shall Never Cease to Admire the Tact and the Intelligence of That gifted porter. But all the donkeys in Christendom, and most of the Egyptian boys, I think, are at the door, and there is some noise going on, not to put it in stronger language. We are about starting to the illustrious pyramids of Egypt, and the donkeys for the voyage are under inspection. I will go and select one before the choice animals are all taken.'